Chapter Twenty Five of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter Twenty Five: Health and Beauty. Doctor Bell of Philadelphia, whose reputation as a medical man and an author is deservedly high, has written a volume, as the reader may already know, entitled Health and Beauty, in which he endeavors to show that a pleasing contour a symmetry of form and a graceful carriage of the body may be acquired and the common deformities of the spine and chest can be prevented by a due obedience to the laws of growth and exercise these laws he has endeavoured and with considerable success to present in a popular and intelligible manner nor was the task unworthy of the efforts and pen of the gifted individual by whom it was executed young women of course are inclined to set a high value on beauty of form and feature as well as to dread more than most other persons what they regard as deformity surely they ought to be glad of a work like that i have described I have no wish to disparage beauty it is almost a virtue there can hardly be a doubt that adam and eve were exceedingly beautiful nor that so far as the world can be restored to its primitive state which we hope may be the case in its future glorious ages, the pristine beauty of our race will be restored. It is sin, in a larger sense of the term, which has distorted the human face divine, disrobed it of half its charms, and deprived the whole frame of its symmetry. Does any one ask of what possible service it can be to know these facts, when it is too late to make use of them? the truth is it can never be too late there is no person so old that she cannot improve her appearance more or less if she will but take the appropriate steps i do not of course mean to say that at twenty or thirty years of age a person can greatly alter the contour of the face or the symmetry of the frame though i believe something can be done even in these respects it was the saying of Dr. Rush that husbands and wives who live happily together always come to resemble one another more and more in their very features, and he accounted for it on the principle of an increased resemblance in their feelings, tastes, or dispositions. And there are probably few who have not observed how much bad passions and bad habits distort the features of every body at every age. Then why should not Dr. Rush be right? and why should not good feelings and good affections change the countenance in a greater or less degree as well as bad ones and what reason then can be given why every young woman certainly those who are far down the column of teens cannot change her countenance for the better if she will take the necessary pains for it that she can do but little is no reason why that little should not be done the very consideration that she can do but little enhances the importance of doing what she can. Let her remember this. Would that the principle were universally remembered and applied. Would that it were generally believed, and the belief acted upon, that the latter-day glory of the world is to be brought about in no other way, by having every individual of every generation through a long series of generations do all in his power aided by wisdom and strength from on high to hasten it do not suppose that i entertain the belief as foolish as it is absurd that in any future glorious period of the world's history mankind will be perfectly beautiful or perfectly conformed to one standard of beauty i entertain no belief in human perfectibility i believe and i wish to state this belief once for all that i may not be misunderstood that we are destined if we are wise to approach perfection forever without the possibility of ever attaining to it to any perfection i mean which is absolute and unqualified nor do i believe that all mankind will ever become perfectly beautiful according to any particular standard of beauty this were neither useful nor desirable there will probably be as great a variety of features and possibly too of size and symmetry in the day of millennial glory as there is now what i believe is this that in falling with our first parents we fall physically as well as morally and that our physical departure from truth is almost as wide as our moral i suppose all the ugliness of the young not of course all the variety in feature and complexion but all which constitute real ugliness of appearance 
comes directly or indirectly from the transgressions of God's laws, natural or moral, and can only be restored by obedience to those laws by the transgression of which it came. It is not tight dressing alone which spoils the shape, but improper exercise, neglect of exercise, over-exercise, and a thousand other things also. Nor is it the application of rouge alone which spoils the beauty. There are a thousand physical transgressions that dim the luster of the eye, or sink it too deep in the socket, or flatten it, or paint a circle around it. So is the face in general. There are a thousand forms of transgression that take away the carnation of the lip and cheek, and leave unnatural hues, not to say pimples and furrows in its stead. I might be much more particular. I might show how every physical transgression, every breach of that part of the natural law which imposes on us the duty of proper attention to cleanliness, exercise, dress, air, temperature, eating, drinking, sleeping, etc., mars, in a greater or less degree, our beauty. Such a disclosure might be startling, but it ought to be made. Dr. Bell, in the volume mentioned, has led the way, and his work entitles him to a high place among the benefactors of our race. But he has only begun the work. The important honour of completing it remains to him or to some of his countrymen. But enough on this subject for the present. If I have convinced the reader whence her help in this respect is to come, if I have convinced her that under God she is to restore her beauty only by coming a true Christian, by having her whole being, body, intellect, and affections, brought into subjection to divine law, especially by a prompt and minute and thorough obedience to all the laws of health and life, as far as she understands them, and by diligent effort to understand them better and better, as long as she lives, and lastly, by the smiles of Almighty God upon her labours and efforts. End of chapter 25